wrote that? Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. We went through the fifth angel, verses 1 through verse 11, and we concluded the last time I taught on this with verse 12. So let's, let's, just, let's just start there. <clears throat> One woe is past. Remember, there's three woes. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes, two woes more hereafter. One woe is past. What we've covered so far <clears throat> included that one woe. But there's two more woes. So let's continue. Revelation chapter 9. Verse 13 and 15. And the sixth angel sounded. Here comes another angel. An angel could have multiple meanings. Remember that. And the sixth angel sounded. And if, if this is the first time you've listened to this teaching, on this section of the last day series, you need the language definitions that I presented in earlier teachings on these trumpets. <clears throat> I'm not going to review any of them. You either can find them on the pastor's blog, on the summaries. That's available there. And where's the pastor's blog? It's at www.teachingfaith.com. Look for them. There's a summary on all the trumpet teaching. And there's also other notes there that you can use, which includes a little bit of the history of the fifth trumpet. That's going to stay on the blog. Whether you're listening to this today, which is May 16, 2024, and if we're still around, May 16, 2030. So utilize it. And we'll change the dates on these blog posts so they'll always stay closer to the top of the blog posts. So those of you <clears throat> who check the blog frequently, unless I say it's an update and give a date of the new date, you don't have to keep on checking if you don't want to. Well, let's continue. Revelation chapter 13. And the sixth, I mean, Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 15. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. S verse 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Put up the map. We now have, here in verse 14, a geographical location right there in the Middle East. As you can see, Euph Euphrates begins in Turkey, another last days player, meanders itself down through Syria into Iraq. and then dumps out towards the bottom of that map right there into the Persian Sea. So starting from Turkey, through Syria, through Iraq. This gives us a geographic location of where this sixth angel which had the trumpet, he loosed the four angels which are bound in the great rivers Euphrates. Now you can debate to the cows come home, as they would say. Were these angels bound in Syria? 
Were the angels bound in Iraq? Were they bound in Turkey? It had to be one of those three areas. By the way, the other river that you see on the right side, that's the Tigris River. And you go about halfway down Iraq, that's where ancient Babylon used to exist. But anyway, I'm not going to make a, a deal tonight whether it start, it, it, the angels are bound in Turkey, Syria, or Iraq, or maybe all three. But let's continue. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of man. As you can see, by the way, when you read through these scriptures, these four angelic messengers are not identified right away. And then, if you jump to Revelation 10, It foretells, now stay with me here, it foretells the close of the Christian era, the Christian age. John is handed a little book of Revelation, but does not start to read the other side of the two-sided scroll until the total of the redeemed are counted in the two witnesses. Chapter 11, the redeemed are taken to be with the Lord at the last trumpet. So it would be the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 15. You can read that real quick. I, I brought, brought this up to, for a reason, which I'll get to later. Revelation 11, 15 reads, And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. <clears throat> now we're jumping from Revelation 9, 15, down now to Revelation 10. Stay with me chronologically. 10 verses 1 through 11. And here, it reads in verse 1, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, arrayed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as the sun, and his pillars and his feet as pillars of fire. Who is this strong angel? Remember, I said angels have, the, the definition of angel has multiple meanings. Who is this strong angel? Well, this matches the description of Jesus in Revelation 1. So this angel, I just call it that for now, is really Jesus. He's no angel. He's the begotten Son of God, only begotten Son of God. This is referring to Egypt, I mean Egypt, uh, Jesus. And he had in his hand a little book. Well, how do you know it's Jesus? Well, we use scripture sometimes to verify what other scriptures are saying. You go to Revelation chapter 1. Let's just start at verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, 
and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto a fine brass. And if he and if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Right there in verse 15, we have one description. Remember what it said in Revelation 10? His feet as pillars of fire. Well, here we have in verse 15, speaking of the Son of God, Jesus, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as, read along with me, was as the sun shineth in his strength. You go back to Revelation chapter 10, what does it say? And the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as the sun. <clears throat> Scripture giving us understanding without making up some Christian science fiction stuff into a silly theory of what this could be. No, this Scripture's already defined who this is in Revelation 10. Chapter 1, I mean, Revelation 10, verse 1. This mighty angel, or strong angel in some translations, comes down from heaven, cloth with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Matches the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. We didn't even have to go outside the book. to get our definition of who this is. And in his hand is a little book. It's a little book open. The little two-sided book of Revelation given to Jesus by God the Father at the beginning of the Christian era. Well, how do you know that? Once again, let's go to the scriptures. This is a back and forth study experience. There's no other way to put all this in chronological order unless you do that with the book of Revelation. Chapter 5, verse... Let's just read verses 1 through 7. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, this is Jesus, a book written within on the backside and sealed with seven seals. I mean, this is God. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, this is Jesus. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? That strong angel is the same angel in Revelation 10 described as a mighty angel. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. We'll come back to that. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book out of my right hand of him, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. The, little two-sided book of Revelation given to Jesus by God the Father at the beginning of the Christian era. And he sat his right foot upon the sea. Let's go back to Revelation. Verse 
Revelation chapter 10, verse 2. And he set his right foot upon the sea, going back to symbolism and what the definition of symbolism, in this case the symbolism of the sea is, is simple. It means people. It means people. You find that in Scripture many times. Not a body of water. It's not referring to a body of water here. And he set his right foot upon the sea. The sea is of people. Well, can you give me at least one verse that will prove what you're saying? Sure. Why not? Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. How does that read? And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, this is about the great mystery, the harlot, even though it's about that, which is another subject altogether, it still doesn't change the definition, the symbolism here. The waters which thou saw where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And he sat his right foot upon what you just read there. Peoples, nations, and tongues. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 10. And his left it says, right foot upon the sea, people, right there in the margin there, and is left upon the earth. Earth being the physical creation, showing that Jesus has total authority over both. Over the people, over the nations, and the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as a lion roareth. Where is that lion coming from? Judah. Judah. With a great force as a lion of Judah. Write that down in, in the margin. And when he cried the seventh when he cried, and when he cried, the seven thunders utter their voices. And when the seven thunders utter their voices, I was about to write. This is John speaking here. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. Wouldn't you like to know what those were? <clears throat> People have been trying to figure this out. Forever, since it was written. Only John knew. But, to the best of my research, the reason why he was told to seal up things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not because it's, it's foretelling the return of Jesus. And God does not want to prematurely reveal events that are going to take place in the next age. This age is just about over. There's another one coming. So, those thunders were to remain sealed because as Revelation 10.1 states, it is foretelling the return of Jesus and God does not want to prematurely reveal events that are going to take place in this, earth, in this, uh, in this last age, or not the last age, in the next age. 
and the angel, or Jesus, that I saw, let's keep on reading, standing upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, sea being people, that there shall be time. There shall be time. Let's just stop there. What is time? Put it on the board. In Greek, it's chronos. It's a defined time. A defined time. It's not a Greek word for time that means delay. That would be chronidzo if it was about delay. But it's not that. It's a defined time. If God intended this verse to be about delay, which many prophecy teachers believe this is the word that should have been used, or at least if they don't believe it, they define it as that, and it's not that. If God intended this verse to be about delay, he used the wrong Greek word to express this, but he didn't. He used chronos. You got that? And it says time no longer. In other words, at the second coming, time as a natural phenomenon will be non-existent for the redeemed. For the redeemed. And we will instantly be in a timeless eternity. And here's the thing. If we're ruling and reigning in throughout the millennium, however long that is, which we haven't gotten to yet, we don't operate in a chronos type time. But the ones that are in the millennium that we're ruling and reigning over will still be operating in a defined time. But we won't. Only the redeemed will be instantly in a timeless eternity. Let's continue reading. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, Sound there is the Greek word, the sound of a trumpet. When he's about to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophet, prophets. Let's read again. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, there the Greek word is salpizo. S-A-L-P-I-D, that's a P. Salpizo, sound of a trumpet. The mystery of God, according to the good things, which he declared to his servants the prophets. No prophets are excluded, so all prophecy relating to this age will be fulfilled at the last trumpet. 
And the voice which, let's read, continue reading, which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel that standeth upon the sea and the earth. So Jesus, who has opened the seven seals, hands the book of Revelation to John. And I went unto the angel, saying to him that he should give me a little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Figuratively, that was that saying, what that is saying there is study it carefully. And it shall make thy belly bitter. But in thy mouth it shall be sweet as honey. What does that mean? Understanding the word of God is sweet to the believers. But the trials and troubles these scriptures foretell bring sadness to the soul. Let's continue. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in the mouth, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my belly was made bitter. And they said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. The Greek language there, palpin, or palin, excuse me, palin means thou may prophesy again. Again, palin means go back or repeat once more turn over the scroll and read the other side that's what it means there remember it's a two sides and they said unto me Thou must prophesy again, go back or repeat, once more, turn over the scroll and read the other side, over many peoples and nations, and tongues, and kings. What is John commanded there to do? To read the other side of this two-sided scroll. And that's where you would have to jump, which you're not, well, we're not, well, no, I'm not going to do it tonight. We would have to jump over to Revelation chapter 12. Because there you'll see it's about peoples, nations, language, rulers of the world, as known to the prophet. And it's referring to the geographical location of the Middle East. You see how confusing this all could be? There is no chronological order in this part of the book of Revelation whatsoever. It jumps around. I think it was designed that way by God because it was not going to be to a set time when this would be all understood and that would be in the last days. And I think that chronos of time, that defined time, was, began at 1948 no later than 1967. And I've covered all this before. And now, we can see what John, in a sense, was trying to figure out himself. But he was just like a scribe writing this down as God probably dictated to him, or an angel that dictated to him, God, did, God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to a messenger. A messenger gave it to John. It all went down the way God wanted it to go down. Confusing? Yes. But I did it this way so you can see that there's no chronological order in the book of Revelation. The error of man is they try to piece it all together in a chronological sequence, the book of Revelation. 
I'm sorry, it can't be done. Let's continue. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 9. Now, I jumped around all over the place. Let's go back to Je Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 15. Because now we have to go back. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns. Let's see if I can find something real quick. You could plug in right in the margin, and the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns. Remember, we read these verses before in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto the unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the sixth angel, back to Revelation chapter 9, sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns. Those four horns were described in, in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, as we just read, of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound. What does that mean? Loose the four angels which are bound. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Some of you think I'm just trying to be cute when I say we're biblical detectives. I'm not. You have to be a biblical detective. You have to let the, let the Spirit lead you to piece this all together. Or else you'll come up with <clears throat> stupid theories about what you think this might be and mislead a lot of people in the process. Matthew 16, verse 19. I have preached the message on this. I don't know where it's located in the website. I don't even remember the title of it, to tell you the truth. But I will give unto thee, I'm in Matthew 16, 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and wh whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever is going to be Bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Go back to Revelation chapter 9. Of the golden altar, which, the four, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound. How do you bind anything? We just read to you what the results were when you did bind something through prayer. The church bound the works of Satan. The church bound the works of Satan in the great river Euphrates. We already seen the geographical location on that map earlier. It's in the Middle East. The Euphrates begins in Turkey, runs through Syria, runs right down through Iraq. But when the Coptic Church 
went into apostasy and no longer spiritually bound Satan, he and his angels were loose to attack the Holy Land. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. By the time we get to the end of Revelation, not the end of Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, where you can read, The second was passed, and behold, the third work will come quickly. Which I have to get back to, Revelation 11 in the future. But by the time we get back, by the time we reach uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, the second will was passed, and behold, the third work come, come quickly. The second will was fulfilled by those four angels. But what did they do? Now we've covered some of it in the past. This age ends. A trumpet is blown in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. That reads, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of this Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But if they were released during the Christian era, when did it happen? When did it happen? When you search through Revelation 9, 13 and through 11, 15, do you see those angels anywhere? Well, I don't have enough time to continue to get into that. I know this might have been confusing, but listen to it closely, write notes. But I'm trying to give you some kind of order how this book was supposed to be once a certain time period came into, once a certain time, a defined time came into existence, how this book should be understood. The problem is <clears throat> too many in the Christian world has taken pieces here, taken pieces there, and try to fit it here, try to fit it there, try to squeeze it into their doctrine of what they think all this means. First and foremost, you let Scripture interpret Scripture. God's already done the job for us. We just have to piece it together. This is like a puzzle. Not a hundred piece puzzle, not a five hundred piece puzzle, not even a thousand piece puzzle. It's the largest piece, the largest puzzle ever had to be pieced together because it involves centuries upon centuries and things that correlate in the secular history world with how this was laid down to be understood can be seen and understood how it fits into history. You just got to put the right pieces in the puzzle. You can't try to force one into the wrong place. It won't fit. It'll never fit. You came and hammer it down without distorting it, without distorting the shape, and in this case, the meaning. Now, <clears throat> we, filled in, we filled in a lot of places as I read along in the scriptures tonight 
of what those things actually mean. The next time we gather and I teach on this subject, I'll continue. Unless you want me to continue tonight. If enough of you call in or email me in, I might be tempted. But that as far as I'll go for now. I want to hear from you. Play the song.